1940s brief, America was at war facing the two most powerful military machines the world had ever known. Every civilian and military resource was pitted against massive armies in the Pacific and European theaters, and there was a real possibility the U.S. might lose. Nashville, Tennessee, city of churches, Athens of the South, although thousands of miles from the World War II battlegrounds, was totally immersed in the war effort. Victory Gardens dotted the landscape from Gallatin Road to Bellmead Boulevard. Nashville Bridge Company worked long hours building sub-chasers for the Navy, while Rosie the Riveter lookalikes crafted Vultee Vindicator bombers just off the Berryfield runway. Given the context, one would think it unlikely that members of a centuries-old downtown church would choose 1943 to establish a new congregation, yet that's exactly what happened. It's into a picture like that that Woodmont Christian Church came into existence. I like to think that we have something unusual to offer. It was in 1943 that a group at Vine Street met. It had been the practice for a number of years at Vine Street to appoint a committee. That committee investigated the establishment of new church somewhere in this green hill section, this Hillsborough section of the city. Remember, Vine Street then was downtown, and so that was no threat to Vine Street's right across the street from us now. But they were seeking a new church. At this uh, meeting in 1943, Bill Carpenter happened to be the chairman of the board. The committee brought in its report again for the umpteenth time. Let's start a new church in the Hillsborough section. Bill said, when are we going to start? Well, they didn't think about that. They'd said that for a dozen years. Bill said, let's start it this year. We'll meet on July the 18th, and those that want to start a new church in that area can assemble at the Woodmont School, and we'll get going. Well, that's the way it took off. They met at the Woodmont School, and 51 people decided they would start a new church out in this area. So out we come. Woodmont's John Carpenter has a unique perspective on the congregation's history. His personal chronology runs parallel to Woodmont over most of the seven decades. Alan, when Woodmont started, I was three years old, and I'm a charter member of the Woodmont Christian Church Nursery. I was, Nursery. I was there, I was three. <laughs> I, I was there on the first day at the schoolhouse, but, but, but again, I was in the nursery, so... Um, you know, that's, that's, that's all I can tell you. Your father was instrumental in uh, establishing the, the Woodmont Congregation. Alan, I think so, yeah. He was chairman of the board at Vine Street, and he was a good friend of Dr. Noe, who was the, the minister at Vine Street, and he told him, once uh, my year as chairman is up, I'm going to start that new church we've been talking about. And he had some other really good folks that were a part of that team. It wasn't just him, but uh, Wilbur Simpson and Charlie Hawkins and some other folks that uh, were the core leadership. What was the rationale for starting the new congregation? Alan, I think I, it had been a dream of Vine Street or, or something they talked about. and. To the best of my knowledge, that group of people just said, we're going to go do it. Uh, the Vine Street folks had thought they would send them out and they would establish it and come back, but uh, the group that left said, no, once we go, we're going to be a part of that church. It was obvious to everyone involved that the congregation's stay at Woodmont School would have to be brief. For one thing, men in business suits and women in Sunday go-to-meeting dresses found those confining classroom desks really uncomfortable. In a matter of weeks, it was clear that the new Christian church congregation had already outgrown that sixth grade classroom in both body mass and sheer numbers. Nevertheless, the school gave the infant congregation its name. In an October 3, 1943 meeting, the board voted to adopt the name Woodmont Christian Church. When in 1943, I believe in the late fall, early to late fall 1943, I was 13 years old, 
and um, I don't know at whose request initially, but uh, on Sunday afternoons late, Ed Kelly, our present Ed Kelly's father, would come around in an old green uh, Pontiac hydromatic to shift car and pick up about six or seven or sometimes it seemed like eight because I'd have people in my lap uh, and take us out to the Woodmont Christian Church to the youth group. And the first time I went, I deep theological reasons I wanted to keep going back. One, the food was better, and two, the girls were a lot prettier than they were at Vine Street. So uh, I guess I can't continue to go to Vine Street for just a little while, but uh, pretty soon uh, elected to join Woodmont and then to be baptized, I think sometime in 1944, I was actually baptized, but I was attending there. And my parents or my father said, uh, to my mother said, Laverne, where is Gene going every Sunday afternoon? She said, well, he goes out to a youth group at a place called Woodmont Christian. He said, well, maybe we better go see what's going on out there. And to use a trite expression, the rest is history. The first few sermons were delivered by Bind Street volunteers and George Mayhew, a Vandy Divinity School professor, but it was obvious a full-time minister had to be brought into the fold as soon as possible. Someone suggested a young man who was born in Austria and grew up in England. Despite the occasional lapse into a Westminster accent, Frank Rowota was working with a church in Mayfield, Kentucky. In September 1943, three members of the Woodmont Board burned a few gallons of rationed World War II gasoline to travel to Kentucky to size up the potential pastor. The Woodmont delegation was quite candid in describing the challenges Rhoda would face. The young congregation included former Baptist, Methodist, and Church of Christ conservatives, and a liberal contingent led by Dr. Mayhew. Initially daunted by the task of walking a tightrope between the two camps, Rhoda eventually accepted the commission. He preached his first Woodmont sermon the Sunday before Thanksgiving, 1943. The Woodmont Board not only faced the job of selecting and installing its first minister, it also pressed forward on setting up the infrastructure common to Christian church congregations. In August of 1943, the Woodmont Women's Auxiliary held its first meeting, and the church leadership assisted in the acquisition of the Bethany Hills Conference Grounds. I remember Bethany Hills from when they were about to buy it. Dad was the guy who was asked to raise the money, which he did, and he said, if I raise the money, I want to be a part of, of scheduling it, and they put him off the committee once he'd raise the money. But there was a, a old, old spring-fed uh, swimming pool across the little creek, and I remember being, being down there once as a very young person in some really, really, really cold water. With its full-time minister in place, the board set about the task of finding a new worship site. Some might suggest it was divine intervention, while others might credit the luck of the draw, but Frank Groota was destined to deliver his sixth Woodmont sermon at the intersection of Woodmont Boulevard and Hillsborough Road. When the Woodmont board learned that the stately J.N. Stone mansion was on the market, they set about securing the financing to meet the $37,500 asking price. The board took possession of the Green Hills property on November 1, 1943, and the congregation passed through the mansion columns for their first on-site service on January 2, 1944. 37.5 was a lot of money for a small breakaway congregation, and providing the Drota family with a dedicated parsonage was out of the question. The logical alternative was to have the Drota set up housekeeping on one side of the mansion, while church activities took over the other half. As things turned out, the Drotas had to live with some awkward compromises. Vivian Drota washed clothes in a Sunday school classroom, the family car was parked in the church dining room, and the odor of breakfast bacon sometimes wafted through the communion service. <laughs> well, on Sundays, my mother, I, you've heard this before, I'm sure, but the first Sunday that we were here, mother was...
cooking uh, a pot roast, and it smelled so good, and everybody wanted to come and have lunch with us. <laughs> and so she was told, no more things door. that are going to smell up the church. <laughs> I love it. So, I love it. Uh, so we, we went to sandwiches on Sundays <laughs> for lunch. The compromise came to a halt in 1946 when the board invested $1,750 for a Woodmont Estates home for the distraught Groltas. The Stone Mansion compromise was never meant to be a permanent solution. During the first Mansion board meeting, William Carpenter pressed for immediate action on a new permanent church home. He pointed to the forested slope south of the mansion as the ideal site for the Woodmont Christian Church Sanctuary. Carpenter also suggested that since the site was downhill from Hillsborough Road, the sanctuary architecture should feature something to capture the attention of folks driving by. Carpenter's suggestion, a really high, really elegant steeple. The Stone Mansion mortgage was liquidated in 1945, and the congregation even had enough money in its $10,000 budget to fund some mission efforts. There was no question the time had come to get serious about Carpenter's proposed sanctuary. The first step involved acquiring another acre of land south of the mansion. The cost, $2,000. In a 1947 congregational meeting, a model of the proposed sanctuary was unveiled in the former Droda garage. The people gathered around the table were informed the dream could become a reality for, say, $225,000. The cornerstone for today's sanctuary was laid in July 1948, and over the next 12 months the building rose from the sloping foundation to become a Hillsborough Road landmark. On July 17, 1949, 700 people attended a service in the unfinished structure. The sanctuary was officially dedicated in November 1949. That first service was accompanied by a Hammond organ that was to be in the sanctuary as its instrument for the next 20 years. Although the construction cost was to be a budget priority for several years, the Woodmont congregation gradually expanded its role in the community and its commitment to the Great Commission. The church hired its first youth director in 1950, established the Hillsborough area's first kindergarten in 1951, commissioned a missionary to Africa in 1953, and chartered Boy Scout Troop 92 in autumn 1953. By 1954, the congregation had grown to the point where a wing had to be added to expand the nursery. And the following year, the board hired Paul Murphy as the first ministerial assistant. An internship program was established between Woodmont and the Vanderbilt School of Religion, and third-year student Winston Wright was welcomed to the congregation. The campus experienced another expansion in 1958, when the board allocated $125,000 for 15 classrooms connecting the mansion to the sanctuary. The following year, the church purchased three additional acres to the south of the sanctuary. That acquisition included the structure we now know as South Hall. Providing a pleasant inspirational environment for worship was always a priority for Woodmont planners. That objective resulted in the sanctuary being repainted a pale rose in 1960. The Garden of Prayer was dedicated in 1961. In 1976, at the urging of the Nashville Junior League, Woodmont launched a three-day-a-week child care program with 40 children in three classes. By 1978, 
The program hosted 85 children, and by 1980, Woodmont's preschool had over 100 students, a full week program, and a summer session. Frank Gerolda's fondest hope for Woodmont was that it would become an umbrella church, an open community providing a comfortable worship environment for all Christians, regardless of their prior denominational affiliation. Although today's mission statement adopts the term bridge church, that prime objective remains. Early on, the Woodmont Board realized the Great Commission dictated that its communal ground philosophy be shared with the community it was duty-bound to serve. In its seven decades, Woodmont has employed a number of events and programs to make potential members aware of what the church has to offer. Over the centuries, Christianity has developed several special worship services tied to major events on the church calendar. Woodmont staged its first Hanging of the Green service in 1965, and in December 1982, our youth group presented a nativity tableau on the lawn between the sanctuary and South Hall. That first nativity scene was to coalesce into the congregation's most popular seasonal event. More on that development later. Frank Garolda's concept of Woodmont being an umbrella church has come to apply to the central organization sheltering several internal groups as well as providing a worship platform for divergent religious philosophies. The internal groups, tight-knit units such as the circles, knitters, hikers, gyms, prayer groups, and the super somebodies foster close relationships between individuals assembled to forward a common cause. No group has stronger bonds or tighter allegiances than the Woodmont Chancel Choir. A half dozen 2013 choir members have been singing in the choir loft since the mid-1970s. Those folks retain vivid memories of co-starring with an up-and-coming country singer in a 1977 Opryland Hotel television special. It's occurred to me that there's some greenery here that could really use a little help getting into the Christmas spirit. And I think what we need here is a little bit of exterior decorating. The 1983 Woodmont Board began making plans for the largest, most expensive expansion of the congregation's physical facility ever attempted. The plan called for a $1.2 million addition to the Sanctuary South Wing. Dr. Jerry Crook, chairman of the board, presided at the groundbreaking ceremony. 
Road, a hall was dedicated on April 27, 1986. Although Woodmont women were active on the board in church support and auxiliary activities from 1943 onward, the congregation quickened the pace for the entire Disciples of Christ movement when Sandra Carpenter was named Woodmont's first woman elder. Sandra was installed on January 17, 1988. Did you feel any trepidation? Yeah, lots. Yeah. Lots. Were you I had been accepted? I had I was generally I had been on the board for years and Woodmont had had women board members since day one to to the, their credit and and was very uh, I would say innovative in that however the women who were board members and by virtue of that deacons did not serve communion and um, it became a joke with the women who carried big heavy trays to serve the men's club dinners and other other servings that they ha weren't you know able to muscle up for that but I, I don't know I don't know the women did not serve the, but Wait, they, they were they board served, members they served the bread but not the no you know, no not at all not at all they didn't go forward are you saying they served food to the yeah, uh, they served but meals, but they did not serve communion, oh, and that was all, all of that was after 87. So that was a big, I guess that was a big turning point. Hmm. Frank Rhoda, the man Woodmont called minister for nearly 30 years, suffered a heart attack in 1972, yielding the stage left pulpit to others. He remained with the congregation until his death, mentoring and advising a succession of ministers, after all, no one beneath the tall steeple understood the communal psyche of Woodmont Christian Church better than Frank Ferdinand Grota. Several ministers have served Woodmont in senior, interim, or associate roles over the past 40 years. Some were masters of pulpit declamation, some excelled in quiet counsel, some offered real-world answers to the world-weary, some were loved simply because they were lovable. Some arrived early when work was to be done, smiling, hammer in hand, carrying a box of Krispy Kreme donuts. Each in his or her own way helped shape the present day identity of Woodmont Christian Church. For the past several years, Woodmont has continued its time-honored tradition of building. However, an evolving society, economic uncertainty, and a hunger for stability shared by all generations has prompted the congregation to reorder our priorities. In effect, we've evolved from stacking bricks and mortar to increasing our community outreach and developing more effective modes of communication. Some locals call us the Woodmont Christmas Church and we can thank Walk Through Bethlehem for that. Walk Through Bethlehem, an outgrowth of that youth group nativity scene years ago, has developed into the most popular annual church event in the Mid-South. 
Hundreds of Woodmont folks are involved in WTV staging and execution, and upwards of 7,000 people visit our campus each year. Although Walk Through Bethlehem is our most visible community outreach effort, it scarcely represents a single line on our annual agenda. Woodmont volunteers apply their skills to Habitat for Humanity, Room at the Inn, Nashville Tools for Schools, and East Tennessee Construction Projects. We've seen a dramatic increase in the Nashville Food Project, built an outdoor labyrinth, sent a resident missionary to Haiti, and support mission efforts in Swaziland, Africa. Not long ago, Woodmont launched The Bridge, a contemporary worship experience offering a youth-oriented approach to the Good Muse on a high-tech platform. We've covered all these bases and more while remaining completely debt-free. Time won't permit a listing of the hundreds of people who kept this choo-choo on the tracks for the past 70 years. The Almighty has that list. And we like to believe folks like Wilbur Sensing, Bill Carpenter, Charlie Hawkins, Joe Bragg, and Tom Mathias have golden passes to the best golf course this side of eternity. We also like to believe that the past seven decades haven't exhausted the heaven-sent reservoir of creativity and devotion that makes every Woodmont Christian Church gathering a joy-filled blessing. Woodmont's ministries have grown and expanded tremendously over the past five or six years. Uh, we have welcomed a number of young couples and young families into our church through our vibrant children's ministry and also through uh, Bible studies and other small groups. Uh, we have grown our outreach ministries and many people have become involved both inside and outside of our walls, which has been very uh, exciting. Uh, the Bridge, which is our contemporary service, is now almost three years old and that provides a new opportunity uh, in a different space and at a different time uh, for folks to come together and to worship God uh, on Sunday evenings. Woodmont has always believed in the ongoing importance of Christian education and discipleship. Our congregation continues to attract many couples, families, and individuals of all ages and walks of life through Sunday morning offerings such as the Spiritual Journeys class, Reflections class, Points of View, and the Young Adults class. The Disciples and Challenge classes on Sunday morning are two very long-standing Sunday school classes that continue to thrive. All our adult classes are comprised of both longtime members as well as many of our more recent members. Through classes and small groups, our congregation is brought together and given the opportunity to know each other on a more personal level. Having that personal contact with other members in a smaller setting seems to be a key element in regular involvement and ongoing participation. We've always known that small groups are an important part of growing any church, and that certainly has been the case at Woodmont. Currently, there are approximately 35 small groups available at Woodmont in which a visitor or member can become connected. From book clubs, visitation groups, men's Bible studies, and fellowship supper groups, to volunteering through the Nashville Food Project and participating in a mission trip, there's something for everyone. A monthly luncheon program for retirees and others interested is called GEMS, Greet, Eat, Meet, and Socialize. Yet another program is called Traveling Woodmont, and periodically this group takes two to three day trips out of town on a church bus to a variety of interesting destinations. On a weekly and monthly basis, there are men's groups, women's groups, couples groups, and groups that bring generations of members together for fellowship, growth, and service. For years, Woodmont has housed one of Nashville's largest AA groups on Tuesday and Thursday nights in South Hall. We've also been a sponsoring church for Room in the Inn. There's been a growing interest in adding additional programs related to coping with the struggles of day-to-day -day life, and we've added these over the past few years. Specialized ministries like Divorce Care, Financial Peace University, and Stephen Ministry are just three examples. Divorce Care focuses on those hurt by troubled or broken marriages, a significant problem in our current society. Financial Peace University is a popular program for educating those who seek budgeting advice and finance-related instruction. Stephen Ministries are lay leaders specifically trained to be present to others going through difficult times and transitions in life. No one ever has to journey through life alone, and Stephen Ministries are available by request. 
Each of these programs is offered to support and enhance the daily lives of our members and those in our community. We are blessed with a landmark steeple, a beautiful building, and a campus that offers unique programming space. Areas like the Spire Bookstore and the Gathering Hall, which offer fellowship time and the opportunity to browse or buy books and gifts. The bookstore can provide books for Sunday school classes, small groups, or even individuals in the church. We also sell books recommended and authored by our ministry staff. Corona Hall is a multi-use space housing our gym, our Wednesday night dinners, the bridge, special speakers, luncheons, breakfast, and in the life of our congregation. Woodmont's highly reputable preschool also serves an entry point for many families to become involved in our church. Ministry at Woodmont is limitless. Ministry among disciples has never been a spectator sport. By that, we mean that members should be involved in this ministry and not just come sit on a pew each Sunday. The Woodmont staff is charged with teaching and empowering ministry so that its members can partner together to discover God's gifts and calling in their own lives and then go out into the community and be the church in the world. There's proof this is happening every day. Our ministries are changing lives both in our community and our world. We are called to be the hands and feet of Christ. As we look to the future, we strive to live by the mission of growing disciples of Christ by seeking God, sharing love, and serving others. We also work hard to adhere to our core values of being a warm and welcoming church, offering outstanding worship, optimizing our outreach efforts, welcoming different traditions as new members join our church, focusing on mission and ministry, all while remaining on the move, nurturing others, and transforming lives. We are Woodmont Christian Church, located in the heart of Nashville, Tennessee. We're building on our great 70-year history as we move into the future grateful for our past and anxious to see what God has in store in the future. As we look to the future, we want to continue to build on our mission statement, which is growing disciples of Christ by seeking God, sharing love, and serving others. We want to keep Dr. Jawoda's dream of having this be an umbrella church where people from many different faith backgrounds and denominations are welcome and accepted and that's a part of the DNA of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. We also have core values uh, built on the word Woodmont. We want to be a welcoming church. Uh, we want to be a church that is committed to outstanding worship in the traditional services, the casual services, and also in our contemporary services. Uh, we want to be a church that is uh, uh, committed to outreach ministries. And we're always developing new opportunities for people to get involved in uh, outreach ministries with both their finances and also with hands-on volunteer opportunities. We're a church that welcomes uh, different traditions and we affirm that and lift that up. Uh, we're committed to ministry and to mission and we want all of our members to discover a spiritual gift and then to use that gift or those gifts to be involved in ministry. We're a church that's on the move, and we're always looking ahead uh, to what is coming and what we can do uh, to remain active in this community and to be a, a vibrant community of faith. This is a nurturing congregation where we support individuals, families, and couples that are going through a difficult time. And then last but not least, we want to be a transforming community where we can change lives uh, each and every day.